Let me begin by just asking how you assess the current array of global headwinds, some of which seem to be very disinflationary. How do, you, how do they affect, in your estimation, the U.S. economic outlook, and how does that impact uh, your thinking about monetary policy? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, so there's two ways that I think about the, the world affecting the U.S., and one is through sort of a direct macroeconomic effect that um, when the world, world is slowing in terms of economic performance, its demand for our goods will slow um, and um, our currency might well tend to appreciate relative to their currencies that make, it make uh, our, us less competitive in global markets. Uh, this will have a slow, uh, create a slowdown effect on, on U.S. growth. But I, I, that's effect. I, I, I think of it as being relatively small. It's, it's it, you know, it's in the, the tenths of a point of of of, of on, on U.S. growth. The more and the reason for that is the U.S. is the fundamental impulse to the U.S. economy. We're so large and so self-contained that the fundamental impulse of the U.S. economy is domestic. Now. The other, there's another channel, though, in which I think what's going on in the world outside affects us, and that's through our demand for our financial assets. Um, you know, I think that what we have seen in the last uh, few months is a, a lot of uh, the, the appearance, a lot of uncertainty in the world about the, the future course of global demand. Um, that uncertainty has led people to demand, uh, instead of going out and buying goods and services, um, they're, they're demanding safe at what they perceive to be safe assets, including um, assets have been issued by the U.S. government, like by like U.S. Treasuries. What that does is it comes back to this question about the neutral, the, the natural rear rate of interest that I pointed to during the course of my talk. It puts downward pressure on that natural rear rate of interest, and so it I, it provides a force that would, that means that monetary policy has to be more accommodative. And in fact, in my own thinking, that second financial markets channel is more material than the the first direct macroeconomic channel. Uh, I have a question about inflation and its determination. You made a, an important point that inflation has been stable and below target. But I suspect many members of the FOMC actually thought inflation would be higher by now. We, we know from the projections that they make. So it seems to me that, that economic theory and practice, both monetary theory and theory of inflation, is in turmoil right now. That there's a lot of uncertainty about what causes inflation. So I wonder if you could tell us what you think drives inflation and in, in what your forecast would be, and how that contrasts with your colleagues, I think some of whom have different views of what really drives inflation. Yeah, again, I, you know, the, the contrast of my colleagues, I'll, I'll refer you to their, their uh, remarks. One of the things that's great about our organization is that people are very transparent about their, their perspectives. And so um, I, 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 it's easier, easier for them for them to speak for themselves than I can. But in terms of my own, own view on inflation, you know, I, I think that one of the prime determinants of inflation is where it's been. <laughs> the fact that its inflation has been so low for as long as it has, I think it makes it harder to turn it, turn it back up. And if, if you want to have a more time series or technical way to think about this, I, I think of inflation as having a, a underlying, uh, very persistent trend in it that, um, you know, I, if we want to move that trend back upwards, we're going to have to see, you're going to have to see inflation move up. Now, that's not the only determinant for it. Otherwise, there would be nothing for us to do. The other determinant is through the reductions in, in, in uh, slack. That is, if we, if we have sufficiently strong economic performance, that does feed into uh, wage pressures. Firms start to bid up employment, uh, bid up laborers, bid up the, the, the price of workers, that is wages. And that then feeds into uh, the prices they set. Now, I spent a lot of time in my, my talking to people in the Ninth District about um, their thinking about wages and, and prices, uh, so employers in particular. Now, the Ninth District is blessed with a very strong economy. So uh, Steve mentioned the states that are included, and I'll just mention my, my home, home state of, of Minnesota where the unemployment's below 4%. And even still in the Ninth District, just now as we're getting down to 4%, we're starting to hear hints of wage pressures. So I think the real question is not about the determination of inflation. It's simply that what we saw, I think a lot, uh, I'll speak, again speaking for myself, I was worried about being, there being significant damage to the labor, for, labor market uh, from the recession. So that we, we, if we get down to unemployment rates like 6%, we start to see wage pressures and then price pressures. Well, I was wrong about that. And it is, it is hard to make that forecast in, in real time. 
And now as I talk to, to people in the Ninth District, um, you know, we're bo well below what would be considered normal unemployment rates, and we're just starting to see wage pressures develop uh, there. So I think that gives me some signal that we have, we have more, more uh, room to run. Now the final piece of what I'm going to talk about, say in answer, my overly long answer to your very good question is, uh, these, I, I think these are telling us something about what's going to happen to inflation as well. Because another piece of what hap shapes inflation is where people think prices are going to be going in the future. If, they, if people start to think that, boy, inflation, the prices are going to grow more slowly, that's going to be built into wage, the kind of wages they offer their employees and what kind of prices then that they end up uh, uh, setting to, to customers. So long, long story cut short, I think where inflation's been in the past is a key to determine where it's going to go in the future. I think where people expect inflation is going to go in the future matters a lot. And then I do think that economic conditions matter through, through uh, it's in their impact on, on, uh, on the tightness of labor markets and then into to price setting. But I think, the, for me at least, it's been a learning experience where I think that uh, uh, if you go back to some of the speeches I was making in 2010 and 2011, I was very worried that there had been structural damage to the, of the labor force. And that's just been proven uh, I was wrong on that. Now there's lots of questions. <laughs> I have sort of a longer term question about this 2% inflation target. One of the technological changes and really structural changes we've seen over the past decades is really deflation in, in the imported goods market and deflation or very, very low inflation in the services market from technological change. So from, for example, non-rival services like Facebook accounts, which don't cost anything to create. On the other hand, we have rival services like university educations, medical care, that have, have had really, really strong rates of inflation. So that 2% is effectively an average between those increasingly divergent paths. Is that average really the best thing to, to target from a, from a policy perspective? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think, I think uh, it's, it's one that we spent a lot of time on when, and uh, it led us to the PCE inflation index, for example, as opposed to the consumer price index. The consumer price index will put more weight on, on shelter um, as opposed to the, the PC price index, which puts more weight on, on, on uh, medical services. All of these are attempts to capture um, an appro you, 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 whenever you do an average, you're going to have to average a bunch over a bunch. Whenever you, if you want to target a single number, you're going to have to tar uh, look at an average across a, a wide range of goods and services. This is an attempt to average according to a particular basket of goods that is being bought by the by the typical typical household in the in the U.S. Uh, different households are going to buy different bundles. I mean, um, younger households probably will put less weight on health services, for example, and they would therefore have a different rate of appreciation of, of prices than somebody who is older. Uh, I, I think this is, what this does is capture um, a reasonable level of inflation for us to be uh, aiming for over time in order to have it, provide us with enough capacity to help the economy in, in bad times. That's what 2% is about, is what level of interest rates are you going to be maintaining over the long run in order to be able to um, cut interest rates by an appropriate amount when you have a shock. And that's why, why, why two is the number that was, was, was chosen by, by the committee. I... Hello, thank you. Um, given that this chart is up here, I think it's an appropriate segue to my question, which is that uh, the FOMC statement and also some statements from your colleagues, which I know you're not going to comment on, <laughs> uh, have made reference to the fact that market-based measures of inflation have moved down somewhat, but you know, there's been references to this as not so much inflation expectations as inflation compensation. Uh, and also there's been this great emphasis placed on uh, survey-based measures of inflation expectations as being uh, you know, a signal that they're relatively stable. So I was curious if you could comment on what your assessment of actual inflation expectations are, the sort of you know, combination of the two, do you think that they're moving lower? Uh, and secondly, if I could ask a two-part question, I promise I won't take too long here, uh, that the, you also made reference to core inflation when, uh, in that last chart where you're talking about how far it is below target, uh, and you mentioned the benefit of it being, you know, stripping out noisy food and energy prices. Is there a particular reason you think why the Fed targets headline inflation, and do you think it's dangerous for 
the Fed to be making references to core inflation at a time when headline inflation is so low relative to the target, uh, you know, dangerous insofar as maintaining credibility that everything is going to be moving back up to target. So, we, yeah, thanks for the question. Let me take, talk about the first piece of it. Um, actually, we, we had a, the Minneapolis Fed um, uh, produced a, a working paper at the end of la towards the end of last year on exactly this question about uh, market-based expectations and this downward movement. Uh, most of this downward movement uh, in the swaps and, uh, and I think in the five-year, five-year break even, there's always liquidity effects in markets and you do want to try to, try to correct for those. Um, but in the paper, what we argue is you don't want to be stripping out risk premium. And the reason is that risk premium are telling you about how afraid are people of low inflation. And I think as policymakers, we should be taking that into account as well in our, in our evaluations. Um, the fact that survey-based measures have remained um, as solid as they have is a source of comfort to me. I would be more comforted if they had not remained as solid as they did in Japan. <laughs> You know, uh, so we are faced with, we, we're faced with a world where we're trying to extract information from a lot of noisy signals. Um, you know, this, I think, is a signal to us, and that's the way I've emphasized it, of, that, we, we're, that, that inflation expectations have, 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 uh, have slipped. Um, and I think that the key is, this is such a challenging problem for central banks to solve, that if you lose control on the downside of inflation expectations, People worry a lot about the upside, and it was very, but we know how to solve that problem. That is, if inflation expectations become unanchored to the upside, we know how to solve the problem. It's hard, it's very costly, but Paul Volcker showed us how to solve that problem. On the downside, no one's really figured that out. So we really want to get, stay away from that, from that outcome, especially given that people seem to perceive it as being associated with uh, such poor economic outcomes as I think is being built in these, into whatever risk premium measures are, are, are here. Kind of a big picture question. Um, your colleague, uh, Mr. Dudley, has mentioned that market movements, potentially uh, bond market movements, um, the extent they indicate misinterpretation of Fed strategy should influence Fed policy. And I guess the question is, um, <clears throat> you know, in retrospect, um, a year ago, or just over a year ago, when the, when the Fed began uh, tapering QE3, um, the market overreacted to that. That is, the 10-year Treasury went up to 3% or slightly above, which, uh, which in retrospect looks like an overreaction. Um, should um, economic fundamentals alone determine Fed policy, or should the Fed worry about bond market overreaction? to Fed actions, or should they just let markets correct on their own and the Fed just focus on the fundamentals? I think we should worry about overreactions to the extent we think those overreactions will affect the fundamentals themselves. So basically, I'm a fundamentals person. That is, and that's this whole, the whole uh, theme of my talk is we're charged with reaching, making monetary policy so as to hit these goals. And um, now, we, I've emphasized sort of the modal outlook for these, for these variables, prices and employment. You should also, and I, but I've given earlier talks where I've, I've suggested that you might also be, want to worry about the risks to those, to those outlooks. Um, and if you think that you're facing a situation where a very, that a communication or an action on your part could cause a very rapid movement in bond prices, that would have an untoward ef effect, not on the positions of the bond traders, but rather on employment and prices, your, your variables that you're trying to target. Uh, I didn't see that, frankly, in 2013. We saw a very fast unwinding of, of positions and a, and a very rapid increase in, in rates, as you, as you made reference to. But I don't think that the eventual outcome of that would have been any different had that increase in rates taken place over a, a more extended period of time. So the speed with which that took place was not, was that, not that material. Uh, so I, uh, but that may not, not always be true. And I, I think we do have to take into account financial market uh, movements insofar as those feed into our macro, macro kind of objectives that we're charged with uh, by, by Congress. Thank you very much for your attention. appreciate the questions. <clears throat>